Hello amazing hackers, hope you're all doing well today. Welcome back to the next part of the video. Now I haven't written an article about this yet, but I still want to tell my thoughts and if I will write an article about this in the future, I'll put it in the comments below. Besides, I've decided to make everything into one big article if I'm going to do it. So if that's going to happen, you'll see it appear on my medium and in the description below. Uh, for the next part, I wanted to talk about where this IDOR can appear. Because you have your identifier in there, and then in my previous re uh, in my previous video, I talked about slash invoices question mark id equals. Now, that is part of the URL, but you can also have your post based IDORs, which means the parameter is going to be in the body of your request as well. Now, that's not the only thing. Also, sometimes. There might be cookies that contain identifiers. Yes, I've seen it before. It can be quite strange. And it doesn't have to be in a directly recognizable form either. Sometimes it can be a little bit obfuscated. Like they might put a, an encryption algorithm on it or they might put it into a bigger hole like a JWT token that might have an identifier in there um, that's easy, that uses the, the or that accepts the non-algorithm to be encrypted again. There are all of these possibilities, like uh, if you encrypt it with the non-algorithm, I mean that the server accepts the JWT token again. So there are all of these different ways of triggering IDORs and it doesn't necessarily have to be your GET uh, parameters. I highly recommend you to look at all of the parameters in there and investigate everything, even the headers. Yes, I know it might seem strange, but even the headers might be a source for identifiers. You never know, just look deep enough. And then of course, you might find object-based IDORs or you might find your user ID based IDORs where you have your user ID equals and the object is going to get wrapped by the specific user. Now the user ID doesn't get given in the in the get parameter anyway. That doesn't happen, but it's as an example, it's pretty good to illustrate it. Where the user ID will probably get drawn from is from things like JWT tokens in this case. So that might also be true. If I, for example, say, uh, try to edit my addresses and the address, yeah, I get added it only based on the specific user that is logged in, but the server checks based on the JWT token who is logged in. They're going to see, oh, user ID equals, I might be able to change that user ID, encrypt it with a non-algorithm and send it back to the server again. So there are these different types of IDORs many different sources that you can grab them from and you really have to take that into account because that's only the start of it when we talk about idors we can also have sorry about that by the way we can also have our secondary versus our primary idors and that's i don't know if you guys ever heard of your primary idors but a primary idor is if you just change a user identifier and then you fire an IDOR. It's as simple as that, that's primary. If you go to a secondary, I'm going to make the server or a secondary system adapt a specific value for me or grab some values for me, like for example, in exporting things or in importing things, I am feeding data to a subsystem and that subsystem is going to feed that data back to the main system, which is going to cause an IDOR because the main system thinks, oh, this request is coming from the subsystem, which is an internal request. I should always allow this. Bam, you have your secondary IDORs there. That's important to know because those places are where IDORs, in my opinion, are going to be most prevalent. And after finding about 30 IDORs, I found most of them in those kinds of places in secondary locations, not in the primary locations. As well, I've told you guys about this intercompany, inner company in multi tenancy. Um, so I talked about this before. I'd say in multi tenancy in here, but I should just remove it because it doesn't have to be multi tenancy. Your companies don't have to be hosted on the same servers in a business to business application. 
By the way, if you missed this real quick, this basically means that you can have IDORs from within your own company where two employees have an IDOR between each other, or you can have IDORs between companies as well. That's also a possibility, of course. Now, I've told you guys in a previous video as well, I've referenced ID equals 432 or something, but that's very rarely going to happen in real life because that's just sequential IDs, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Usually in real life, of course, either the system is going to be secure or it's going to use UIDs, which are these random long strings of text that you're never going to be able to guess easily. Um, so for those things, what I always do is I have, if I have a UUID, I'm going to look for an endpoint that discloses all of those UUIDs. Sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I don't find an endpoint disclosing the UUIDs. If I don't find any, and if there's no way for me to find that UUID, don't report it. It's really simple, just don't report it. Now, the impact, it can range from a wide variety of things. You can have your destruction of data, of course, which is going to happen on the delete call, but can also happen on a put and a post call or a patch call. Um, you can have your updation insertion. Um, you can have your grabbing of data for IDORs. The range is pretty wide and vast. And as you can see, there's a lot of different things that go into making an IDOR, you can have a lot of different aspects to it and it might seem simple. It might seem like simply changing a number, but knowing what numbers to change and when to change them is what makes all of the difference in the world to me. Now, of course, there are some port swigger labs, which are pretty good. I'm going to create some labs for IDORs as well, because I think it's a pretty good vulnerability type, to be honest. Um, and I'm going to create some IDOR labs for all of these different types, get post variables. I'm even going to throw some cookie based user ID um, IDORs in there. So I'm going to try everything and these kind of things, building the labs helps me get a better understanding of how these vulnerabilities arise. Now, of course, there are labs that are part of my course, which the link is going to be in the description below. But of course, there's also going to be a free labs, uh, which I have available. So if you're interested in that, I highly recommend you to just join it. I'll also put a link in the description below. It's got everything from cross-site scripting to CSRF, everything's in there. Um, and specifically for IDORs, there's also a big part about that in my bug bounty guide. But for now, I'm going to leave it at this. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you had some trouble, feel free to rewatch the video because this is not very easy to understand. It might seem very easy, but all of these different aspects that go into an IDOR make it quite complex. Thanks again for watching everybody. You guys are amazing and I hope I will see you in the next one. Bye amazing hackers.